delighted to be here today at this uh, workshop and our, dis our topic is funding do's and don'ts and with us is David Royal who is the um, Executive Vice President of Programming and Production for the Smithsonian Channel and one of the major players in content rich um, documentary programming in the world today. But David I want you to briefly introduce yourself and describe your role at the um, Smithsonian Channel. So I basically head up the um, programming and production for the Smithsonian Channel, which is a relatively new uh, American-based channel. Uh, I started my career as an independent producer, uh, and I spent a lot of time on the outside of MIP looking in. Uh, so I have some idea of what a lot of people here go through. Uh, and uh, I'm now fortunate enough to be commissioning uh, for what I think is, is, is one of the best uh, new American nonfiction channels. And so you're a joint venture between? We're a joint venture between. Well, we have pretty interesting DNA. On the one hand, we've got Showtime, which is known for great shows like um, The Tudors and Californication uh, and Homeland, of course. Uh, and uh, that's the entertainment side of our, our upbringing. Uh, and on the other hand, we have the Smithsonian, which is the world's largest uh, scientific and educational institution. And so your mission, your... And, and our mission is to provide programming that is entertaining, but has content to it. It's a fairly novel concept these days uh, in American television. Uh, but uh, it's really important to us that we provide both parts of that puzzle. Uh, so we're not going to put on anything that is boring. It has to be entertaining, but it has to also have content and integrity. So that's going to move us on, David, to our first, um, our first uh, takeaway here and that is to know exactly who you're dealing with when you pitch a channel. And so I've got this conceptual chart here that we'll work through for just a second, and I'm arguing in this chart that for US networks, the trend is very much towards reality TV series, towards character-based entertainment rather than content-driven specials. And you can see at one end of the spectrum, this applies mainly to the States, but also the trend I hear is in Australia and around the world, You've got uh, Comedy Central, but then History, Animal Planet, Discovery, leaning towards this entertainment-driven reality. And at the other end, we've got the Smithsonian Channel kind of standing out amongst a smaller crowd. I mean, how do you respond to this type of characterization of the landscape, David? Well, you know, I, I guess I'd say it's a little, as any diagram is going to be, slightly simplistic, because uh, I would hate to think that we're the information end and not the entertainment end. If Certainly within the American market, if we do informational programming that doesn't entertain, we're dead. Uh, you've got to bring the audience in. Uh, and so I, I certainly see us somewhere a little bit more towards the middle here, but I see it all jumbled up anyway. I think what I do see is where we have reality television, I see character-led um, nonfiction programming, and in many cases, slightly manufactured programming. Uh, and that's not where we are. We are we certainly are going to have characters on our channel, uh, but we're not doing uh, what I call fabricated programming, programming where, where the reality is being created by the filmmaker as opposed to the filmmaker filming the reality that's out there in the world today. So, David, a takeaway, though, is when a producer comes to pitch to you, or for that matter, when they're going to History or Animal Planet or Spike, to know exactly where you are on this spectrum and other spectra. It must be a real turnoff when a producer comes in and pitches like a, a character-driven reality show. No, it's not necessarily a turnoff, and I'll get to that when we, when we do one of our case studies a little bit, a bit later on. Uh, and in fact, I guess my message to most filmmakers is I prefer to hear an idea, even if it's not quite, quite right for us, because you never know. Uh, frequently, people will bring to us what they think we want. And with the Smithsonian, that tends to be rather serious topics and rather serious programming. And sometimes that is what we want. But quite frequently, we're looking for something different. We're looking to be surprised. Uh, and so I guess one message I think every commissioning editor has uh, to filmmakers is do your homework, make sure you've been on the website. If you can, watch the channel, get a sense of who that channel is. Uh, but don't put yourself in too, and don't put us in too small a box. All right. So uh, takeaway number two is when you approach a network like Smithsonian, understand the deals that are um, available to you and that are prevailing in the industry. And I've got another one of these big conceptual charts here. And on the lower left-hand side here, you can see 
with less editorial control being exercised by the network and typically at a lower cost is an acquisition, buying a program off the shelf. There is a little more cost and editorial control over a, um, a pre-buy and then with much more editorial control and usually a lot more cost, we have co-productions and then a work for hire where the network totally buys out kind of all rights, typically all territories for a production. So David, where are you in this mix? We, we do the whole spectrum here. So um, when we're at a market like MIPDOC, uh, we're certainly looking for acquisitions. And one of the great things about MIPDOC is it's full of little surprises. Uh, and uh, we love uh, finding films that have been created by companies we've never uh, seen before. So that's one of the things we do here at this particular market. Um, but then we're also looking for co-production partners. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the thing about a co-production is the more money you're able to bring to the table, uh, the more you move to the right-hand side of this, this graph towards the work for ha, or, or, or rather the more contr editorial control uh, you have. Uh, so if you're bringing a good part of the package and you have some great advantages uh, outside of America in doing that, uh, then you have a lot more say in, in how your program is going to look and be. Uh, and then the work for hire is where we pay 100%. Um, and we certainly do that with, with projects that we really want. Uh, and in that case, uh, we have total control. And at the end of the day, we, we own it all. Um, and so uh, money is power in a way. And uh, if you bring money to the table with your production, uh, then you have more say in where that production is going to go. So I've got one slide, and then we're going to go to our clip, which we probably should have run earlier. But, but David, History Channel, for example, uh, as you can see, is the dark blue. Nearly all of their programming is work for hire. They own the lot. And then ID, which is Discovery's uh, crime-based um, and very successful channel, uh, there is a real mix with uh, a lot of co-productions particularly out of Canada. So where are you on that kind of, with, with the mix between acquisitions, co-pros and work for hire? We're, we're definitely closer to uh, ID investigation discovery. We're probably about a third, a third, a third. Uh -huh. um, and uh, uh, that's, that's about our mix. Great. I've got another one of these frameworks and they help us under, you know, understand how an, uh, uh, an area of activity is, is an enterprise is structured. So I try and divide the universe of non-fiction programming directed towards channels into these three tiers. A signature series, which are your quarterly or even your annual big promotion, promotional events. And then you've got your more regular uh, specials and series. And then uh, popular formats yeah. like LA Frog Stars. But let's go back up to the top. Now, as we talked about two, two projects here, the Day Kennedy died. Is that yep. a Tom Jennings production? No, that is not. Right. So, um, and also Titanoboa. So just tell us briefly about those two projects and the kind of deals they yeah. came with. Both, both those projects are co-productions. So the day Kennedy died, which is being um, uh, on the stands with Cineflex uh, here at this, this market, was done with Fine Stripe uh, out of London uh, and is a co-production with ITV, the big commercial uh, network in, in the UK. Uh, and um, that's our, I guess, about our third or fourth co-production with ITV uh, that for quite a long time has not really been doing these big non-fiction specials. Uh, but we started by doing a co-production with Brooke Lapping uh, and ITV, 9-11 uh, Day That Changed the World. Uh, they put it into prime time, moved the nightly news in the UK uh, to make room for it. Uh, and it was one of the top... Uh, it was, I believe, the top-rated factual program of the year. And so we've moved on from there. And what, what, what we was have, that program again, David? Uh, that was 9-11, uh, Day That Changed the World. Um, and what we've found is that these are fairly traditional programs uh, in, in terms of their style. 9-11, um, Day That Changed the World, uh, the conceit behind that film was that uh, it would only use footage that was shot on the day of 9-11, uh, and it told the story through the eyes, the uh, recollections of the sort of the leaders as they heard what was transpiring, whether it was um, the first time Bush heard or whether it was from the viewpoint of the pilot of Air Force One and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, I was a little scared going into it because I thought this is a, tra a traditional documentary art form. 
But the key there was that the filmmaker um, really emphasized the drama. Mm -hmm. And even though it was traditional in format, it was infused with real ex tension and drama. Uh, and once you started watching, you couldn't leave it. Uh, and I think we're finding the same with the day Kennedy uh, died, uh, in which case, again, we are very much telling it through the eyes uh, of the people who were there in Dallas leading up to uh, uh, Kennedy's uh, assassination. Who's the producer um, of that, uh, that that's, um, I'll have to give it to you in a second, Peter. Right. Uh, but but uh, it's coming out of uh, Fine Stripe Productions out of the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, and uh, the key really is that, is, is that it is, is in the storytelling. That same production could be done in a way that would be totally lacking in drama and flat. Uh, and uh, it's a real art form uh, to bring those traditional forms to life. Uh, and that's what audiences demand today, is they demand real uh, fast-moving uh, and uh, compelling storytelling. So in terms of the deals then, for these, these are big, I won't say they're million dollar productions, but they're, they're, they're more costly for their yes. total budgets than yep. by far than the a average. Um, is there a type of, do you prefer a co-production or do you ever do a work for hire where you buy out all rights for one of these big projects? Um, with the really big ones, we're highly unlikely to do it just by ourselves. Uh, mm -hmm. We like to um, have a partner on them, and we find that partnering with um, international partners works extremely well. Uh, you get a, uh, a sort of creative tension that, in the, uh, when you're working well together, actually I think leads to stronger programs. It also allows us to bring more money to the table, and Titanoboa is a case in point. I mean, what's interesting about Titanoboa, which is a story of the discovery of the world's largest snake. Uh, now, this is a snake that was about 40, 40 to 45 feet long, uh, could have swallowed Peter and uh, I in a moment, and you wouldn't even see a bulge go down its stomach. It was a uh, TV executive, was it? Uh, it uh, <laughs> had some of the characteristics of a TV executive. <laughs> uh, and uh, Titanoboa was based on the uh, discovery of fossilized remains uh, down in an uh, open-faced coal mine in Colombia, uh, in Latin America. Uh, and this was done by Wide-Eyed uh, out, uh, out of the UK. And in that particular case, we went to them uh, and uh, teamed up with them. They'd, they had been part of the team on Walking with Dinosaurs. Uh, and we jointly went out to find co-production partners. And on a really good project, we will do that. We'll have a production company that we feel is right for a project or has brought it to us, and we will work with them uh, to try to put a package together if we can't do it all ourselves. Right. Um, let's look at kind of specials and series. This is more kind of regularly budgeted and yes. regularly developed projects for your kind of month-to-month -month schedule. And we talked about, we're going to talk briefly about two cases. One is called, uh, the sh the, has the working title of The Shot, and the other is uh, Treasures Decoded. But let's have a look at The Shot, first of all. And um, this is an interesting acquisition case study. I should butt in here and say that Peter is, is one of the co-executive producers on this project. Thank and, you. And, and brought, it, brought it to us. And uh, I've got to tell you, I've worked in the, t in the industry for 30 years in the States, and this is the first time I've EP'd a project of this kind. And I'm just incredibly honored to be working with the Smithsonian. Thank you. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a project that's dear to my heart. So tell us a little bit about, oh, I'll set it up, David, is that I was originally approached by a foundation in the States called Steeltown, and they're based in Pittsburgh, and they promote Pittsburgh stories. And Jonas Salk developed this, his anti-polio uh, vaccine in Pittsburgh. And they developed this project as a uh, real testament to Pittsburgh's history and vitality. And it was acquired, uh, we, they produced the film, we sold it to... Uh, we license the international rights to Mercury Media, and Tim Spark is a great friend of ours who I recommend you uh, connect with here. And then uh, Tim and I came back and, and presented the opportunity of working with the Smithsonian. So what was your reaction and what happened well, next? It's, 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 a t it's an incredible story in itself because the eradication of polio... Um, I mean, people have forgotten just how terrible uh, a disease that was for many people and uh, how it struck children uh, on a massive scale. Uh, and the fight to eradicate it is a truly inspiring 
uh, one of people coming together. But of course, polio still exists around the world. And so what interested us was the fact that, that on the one hand, you'd got very successful eradication in many, many countries around the world. Uh, and then you still had a few places where it was uh, holding on, like Pakistan, Afghanistan, I think Nigeria, places where it's very hard to get access to the people who need the vaccines. Uh, and so it has a contemporary feel and a historic part to this story. And I think the other thing that, that interested us, and you know, this gets to the heart of what, uh, certainly what gets a, um, uh, uh, a programming executive like myself interested in a project. It's, it's, of course, it's the story, and it's the quality of the filmmaking. Um, but it's also, if you bring something else to the table, um, that can make a difference. And in this case, what um, Peter and, and Tim Sparks at Mercury Media had is they had interest also from Bill Gates and the Bill Gates Foundation. Uh, and then they had interest from Rotary International that's raised something like a billion dollars over the years uh, to uh, uh, help uh, wipe out polio. And so we felt that not only would we be getting a film, but we would be getting a marketing machine to go with the film. And as a small channel, if you have a program that's gonna break through and create a buzz and create awareness and create noise, uh, and indeed, get behind an issue that's really important, that has real value to us. So we interviewed Bill Gates uh, on um, Valentine's Day, and it's only the second time he's ever given an interview. So, you know, it was a great honor to have him involved in the project. So you're remaking what was a relatively lower budget, as I said, smaller town yep. production. And you, you, as part of the deal here, Yes. are reinvesting in the upgrading of the film, is that right? Yeah, we will sometimes do that. If we, are, we see a film that we think is essentially a fine piece of work, but, but at least for the American audience, need, need some more uh, put into it to really make it sing, uh, we will get into a negotiation with the director, uh, and it's a back and forth, and we try to be really honest about what we're going to do. Uh, and uh, we say, look, if we're going to take your film and rework it, you do have to understand we're going to have editorial control because it has to work for our network. But we will collaborate with you, and we will work very hard not to go against the intention of what you were trying to do with this film. And indeed, what the filmmaker may have done with the film may work brilliantly for the market, the country that they're operating in. It may just not be quite right for what we want. And indeed, we, as I say, we may want to put more resources into it. And we'll say to them, if we do that, you know, you've got to accept this going in. It can't be a battle. It has to be a collaboration. And if you don't want to have that collaboration, don't join with us on it. Uh, and we've found that works very well. You know, if you're honest up front uh, and you confront the issues at the very beginning, it's like any other relationship, um, it really can work extremely well. And we've done that with several projects. Uh, we did one recently uh, with uh, a German production company. We're very pleased with the results. So Steel Town is, just for the record, extremely happy with this relationship. And what Steel Town and Mercury Media are getting is a substantially upgraded film to take out to the international market. So it's a fascinating case study. Thanks, David. So let's go back to our pyramid, and we'll move on to another example of a, of a, a project, and we'll drive down to the, what kind yep. of deal it is about secrets or treasures decoded, as it's also yep. titled. Well, Secrets, uh, which is also known as Treasures Decoded, uh, is produced by um, uh, Dan Chambers' company uh, out, of, out of the UK, Blink. And again, it's an interesting model in that the way that uh, really came about is that Dan and I sat down in, in London and started talking. Dan had been head of programming at Channel 5 for, for a number of years, and we talked about what we'd seen work, what, what, what programs people really found interesting. Uh, and then we very, very loosely came up with a concept, uh, which would be to investigate the subjects that we had found people were fascinated by, but really going into the latest history, the latest forensic science and investigations. Uh, and some of them are the, are the traditional subjects like um, the Shroud of Turin. You know, most television programmers will tell you uh, that you can put a program about the Shroud of Turin on uh, any time of day or night and an audience comes to watch it. Um, now, we wanted to do something new. We wanted to make sure it had a lot of uh, integrity, and we really were looking into the latest research. Uh, but we went through a whole series of subjects. Dan's company, Blink, 
uh, took the idea away and they developed it. Uh, and they um, came up with their, their list of topics. Uh, we chose uh, from a choice of, let's say, they would come up with 12 topics and we might take six. Uh, and they then went around to broadcasters uh, in different markets such as Canada uh, and in France uh, and found partners to join with us. So we, in this case, are the lead uh, production partner, um, but Blink went out and found other partners. And by doing that, they get to retain uh, quite a healthy uh, amount of the rights mm -hmm. because they have invested uh, their, uh, their time and, and uh, uh, money and effort into putting the whole deal together. Uh, and so we will basically usually take North America in a situation like that. Uh, and uh, they will essentially probably control most of the rest of the world. Uh, so that works for both, both parties. Um, and in, at the same time, we get a much better budget uh, than we could otherwise afford. And actually, out of that uh, story, which started by looking at some of the more traditional subjects, um, we immediately hit the jackpot uh, and uh, got the exclusive uh, uh, story about the um, gospel of Jesus' wife which some of you will have uh, read about. It's a very controversial new discovery of a small piece of papyrus uh, that has uh, in it Jesus saying, Jesus said, my wife. And it's those words more than anything else that went around the world, uh, hit newspapers around the world um, because of the suggestion uh, that uh, it implied that at least there was a debate going on uh, in amongst early Christians about Jesus being married, uh, which of course shakes up a lot of the tenets uh, of, 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 of Christianity. David, uh, can I ask you how the Smithsonian responds to these kinds of controversial scientific information? Do they really crack the whip over you to get it yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, is um, at some channels, you'd go out with a story like that and you wouldn't be too concerned, maybe, about whether it was absolutely right or you could draw all sorts of inferences uh, and suppositions which you could then qualify later on. That doesn't work for us. Um, we really have to um, do our very best to, to be accurate. And every program we do goes through a review process by the Smithsonian. So it is reviewed for factual accuracy and, and uh, for, for, for balance. Just quickly, how many episodes have you commissioned in this series? Uh, in that particular case, I believe we started with six. And that's fairly common for us when we're doing a series, is to start with something like five or six shows uh, with the hope that uh, it'll work and then we'll go on and do more. And indeed, the last series we did with Blink, we started with five, um, and uh, uh, it's called The Real Story, and that ended up being 22 one hours. Wow, that's a lot. Big order. So uh, let's finally look at LA Frock Stars. That's more of your popular entertainment. Yeah. I was surprised when I saw that on your clip. Yeah, and, and, and LA Frock Stars sort of goes back to the beginning slide. Um, you know, we are an entertainment channel. Um, and uh, LA Frock Stars is a character-led program. Uh, but it doesn't mean we're going the route of uh, Honey Boo Boo. You know, we're not. Uh, the difference with LA Frock Stars is that uh, uh, this is a show about a woman. Uh, Doris Raymond, who has a clothing store, vintage clothing store in Hollywood uh, called The Way We Wore. And uh, Doris is a fantastic character, um, and, uh, but she's unbelievably knowledgeable. Uh, she's a walking encyclopedia in terms of her knowledge uh, of vintage clothing. Uh, and uh, what was interesting here, Peter, is the pitch. Uh, it goes back to what I was saying at the beginning, was that this was pitched by Phil Fairclough at Natural History New Zealand. Right. And Phil came into my office and had a whole load of natural history programs, which is what you might expect from Natural History New Zealand, given their name. And uh, we went through all the programs he had for us, and none of them were quite right. Uh, and as he was leaving, I said to him, you know, Phil, are you working on anything else? Now, he may have set this whole up because he's a very canny pitcher. And at that point, he said, yeah, but it's nothing that you would like, <laughs> which, of course, is the, is the final sort of moment of baiting one. And I said, well, whoa, hold on a second. Tell me about it. And he said, I'm doing this reality character-led program, and you don't do that. And I said, no, no, no. Tell me about it. And he showed me this clip of, of, of Doris. And the thing about it is that, and I think this is the essence, Doris Raymond had actually turned down at least a dozen other production companies and networks who wanted to do a program about her store and what she does. And she turned them down because of something that, that really epitomizes the way we look at this sort of programming. 
She didn't want progr a program about herself, her staff, and her store if it diminished and it demeaned. And uh, we're not interested in programming that diminishes and demeans. We're not interested in programming that just makes people look crazy. Um, and programming where you're just laughing at them. We're, we're okay if you laugh with them, and it's okay, uh, it can have character, it can have vitality, but it's gotta have some integrity, and the viewer at the end of the day has to have something they take away, something they've learned. And we think LA Frog Stars does just that. Uh, and we put it out at the same time as a new show on Bravo, uh, and uh, suddenly the American press compared us very favorably in the way we're approaching uh, this sort of programming. Uh, David, we've got one uh, more slide, and then we're going to go to Q&A. And that's finally that, um, you know, there's a question of financial risk. So if we look at this conceptual production here, it's got a budget of, let's say, $300,000. The US channels, the Smithsonian, you might put in 30 or 40 percent of that for US, US rights, although we've been clear that the spectrum is all over the place. And then international pre sales might put in another 40 percent. So we've still got a deficit. And so where are your producers covering that deficit? Yeah. You must work with them or, or we observe do. how they execute. We do. And, and again, we will work um, proactively with people in the right circumstances. You know, there's, there's things like the European Media Funds um, and in Australia, of course, is Film Australia and, and other uh, types of quasi-government funds available to filmmakers. In many cases, to get those funds, you require a broadcaster. Sometimes you require several broadcasters to be able to release the funding. Uh, and we will uh, support a project if we like it and write letters uh, and proactively try to help, help you raise money against that. Um, you know, I think that deficit is a fairly large one. Sometimes people deficit finance themselves. Uh, there's risk involved in that, as you know. Again, if you're doing that, then you get points in terms of your ownership later on. Uh, but it is a dangerous uh, proposition right. uh, unless you've got a fairly large and, and vibrant company. So you like to see your projects fully funded before you green light them? Yeah, we, we will not, uh, not go ahead with a project that doesn't have all its funding in place. Now, that can include some deficit funding, but we've got to feel that the company is strong enough to be able to do that. All right. So um, we're going to go into Q&A, but in case we forget at the end, if anyone wants these slides, they can give me, my, give me their business cards at the end and I'll send them to you. Secondly, uh, thanks to uh, MIPDOC for having us here. I forgot to uh, say we're very honoured to be here today at the first, kind of first panel. So, and I hope everybody here has a wonderful time. And thirdly, Q&A. We have seven minutes and 50 seconds. We have a question over here. By the way, here's Tim Spark, our uh, producer of our distributor of the shot. Thank you. Very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Michael Frank. I'm from Helsinki, Finland. Uh, one question. Um, do you uh, uh, accept uh, involvement in, in, in financing from companies that relate to the, uh, to the target of the story itself, if you can guarantee factual accuracy? Uh, that's a very good question. Of course, as a model, it's becoming increasingly popular. Um, we will certainly discuss that option. Uh, we have some restrictions, uh, but we think that, the, that it depends. You know, for instance, we're not going to uh, do a, uh, I think, a, an environmental project funded by an oil company that has a conflict of interest. That's just not going to happen. We are very, very jealous of our protecting our integrity. But, but yes, we would, we would certainly be open to discussions uh, about uh, uh, having a project that had some sort of commercial backer uh, behind it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think for us, it's also going to be about being absolutely um, transparent uh, with our audience about uh, who's involved in a project. Question? Any questions about, um, about the deal? The deals that Smithsonian ent entertains. What about Frock Stars? What was the story with well, Frock Stars? Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Dave. Uh, my name's David Forbes. I'm an independent producer from South Africa. I'm, I'm just interested, you know, your, your sizzle reel is, is all about like American stories largely, and I just wondered how much scope 
there is actually for um, stories that are about foreign places, about people from Africa, yeah. things like that. Yeah, good, good question. Um, you know, that the sizzle reel is made, uh, that sizzle reel is made uh, principally for uh, advertisers. Uh, so uh, it has a probably stronger American bent uh, than I would, would, would say that we really are. Um, we're doing a lot with South Africa straight off the front. Of course, a lot of it is wildlife programming. Um, we have a very close co-production relationship with a company called Earth Touch uh, out of Durban, uh, which has been very, very successful. Again, started small. We're stuck with them. They're stuck with us, and it's grown. Uh, so we have a sort of output deal there, which is very, very valuable to both parties. Um, one of the programs that there were some clips from there is um, about Anchor Watt, a uh, fantastic program made by uh, Korea's uh, EBS. Uh, and indeed, one of my... Um, and, and that program, we did do the reversioning that we talked about. Uh, and indeed, part of our deal with them was that we would do an English version uh, and uh, we put in a new host. We uh, did a lot of work on the, uh, the rewriting. And then we gave the English version back uh, to the Korean broadcaster, who then had a new English version uh, for taking to the market. Uh, so that's another, another thing that we will do in certain cases and can be valuable uh, for both parties. And the wonderful image, the last image on that clip reel is of a goshawk. I think it's a goshawk going through some two trees. I found that film here at MIPDOC, I guess it was three years ago, hmm. just trawling through the library of tapes. Uh, and it was done by a, um, a very talented uh, a Korean filmmaker. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and we will do international, to go back again, we absolutely will do international topics. Um, but an American subject probably rises a bit more uh, up our list of, of, of needs. Uh, but we have a pretty wide, wide variety of programming uh, going out on our channel. And I also want to make one reference, which is a filmmaker um, on the 9-11 films, Leslie Woodhead, who is a very, very talented uh, UK producer. Thanks, David. Tim, uh, there's a microphone coming. As someone who, who, who works with you, I was, I was actually quite surprised to see that um, music seems to be a topic... Um, you're interested in exploring at the moment. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what your plans are in that genre. Yeah, mu music, music is, is an important part. The Smithsonian has the Folkways uh, collection, which was one of the early uh, collections of uh, sort of roots music, blues, jazz, you know, lead belly, people like that. Uh, and uh, they've now moved into, they're doing a visual sort of hip hop collection. And so we feel music is, is again part of who we are. Uh, to go back to your question about international topics, one of the first music shows we did was about Vianatu, which is Colombian accordion music. Uh, beautiful film made by Alan Tomlinson. Um, not a, uh, an American moment in it. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, music is, is, is important to us. Typically, we're looking for the big music stars. Uh, we're doing a musical series of our own right now out of the States. We just filmed Dr. John. Uh, who won the Grammy this year for Best Blues uh, Album. Uh, and we did, uh, we work with Eagle Rock uh, and uh, have uh, just shot um, uh, Blondie in New York. So, uh, yeah, no, we're very interested in music. Any more of course, questions? the rights are incredibly challenging with music. Uh, we're actually trying to uh, get a project off the ground right now with a German production company that's been working for a long time uh, on a project about Johnny Cash. So I've got a question, David. I've heard about New Ze Natural History New Zealand. I've heard about Canada. I've heard Germany. I haven't heard the word Australia. Well, we've done a lot, a lot with, uh, with Australia too, um, with companies like Prospero, uh, who did a uh, dinosaur stampede show for us. Um, we've worked with Sonia Pemberton. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, she won an Emmy uh, for our channel this past year. Uh, and. Uh, you know, Australia is a very vibrant market. And Australians, you know, I always think it's so unfair on the American producers at these markets because those of you who don't come from the States, you really do have a competitive advantage if you leverage it successfully. Uh, and that is that so many other countries have pools of um, funding available uh, to them to help filmmakers. 
Uh, and you also have domestic broadcasters who will pay a premium for your programs. And if you can work that end of it and then bring programs while at the same time thinking about the US market, uh, you, are, you, know, you are way ahead of your American counterparts in that way because they really don't have access to those sorts of funds. So David, it's, uh, we're down to the last uh, 33 seconds here. We don't have time for a question, uh, another question. But thank you so much. We have another panel right after on uses of the archive, which I strongly recommend. It's a, we're doing a fantastic state space, uh, sorry, case study on the Martin Luther King assassination. It's very, very interesting, and that's with Tom Jennings. We're on right after. Benjamin and the audiovisual team, thank you for helping us today, and thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you.